Real simple. Let's start off by taking a look at the atom. You know the atom is the smallest bit of any element. If you start cutting an element down smaller and smaller, the smallest thing that you end up with that still retains the property of that element is the atom. And there are a couple of different parts to the atom, different pieces to the atom. In the center of the atom, there's something called the nucleus, N-U-C-L-E-U-S, the nucleus. And then in orbit around the atom, there's this teeny weeny little thing, a little subatomic particle called an electron. The electron is like a, a planet that's in orbit around the sun, basically. Uh, but the orbit's a little bit different. You know how in the sun, we have like, uh, in the solar system, the sun is in the middle and the planets orbit around it in kind of a planar orbit. That is, they're all in what we call the plane of the ecliptic. They're all in like one orbital plane like this. The atom, the, the, the electron is kind of a frenzied orbit. The, the electron orbit moves all around the, the centrally located nucleus, all around like this, kind of like if you've ever taken the cover off of a golf ball, the, you see the rubber bands that are wrapped around it, or the old ones used to be anyway, or a softball, it's the string all wrapped around. If you could, if you could somehow see that, that electron orbit, that's what it would look like. It would kind of look like a very thin shell surrounding the nucleus. In fact, that's what they call the orbit of the electron. The orbit of the electron is called the electron shell, if you could somehow see it, which we can't really do. Now, we know that in the solar system, there's this thing called gravity, and gravity is what keeps the planets in orbit around the sun, right? Well, in the uh, atom, there's a slightly different type of force that keeps the electron in orbit around the nucleus. But it's not called gravity. In the atom, this force is called an electrostatic force. And this electrostatic force is what keeps the electron in orbit around the nucleus. It's like an attraction between the orbiting electron and the nucleus. Kind of like gravity works in a completely different way, actually. And uh, I'm not a physicist, so I can't really tell you exactly how it works. doesn't help you to fix games to know that anyway. What I wa just want you to see is that the, the electron exists here. Now, what, what actually keeps the electron in orbit around the nucleus is that... The nucleus has what we call a positive charge. The nucleus has a positive charge. And the electron that's in orbit around it has the opposite charge. The electron has a negative charge. And there's an attraction between the positively charged nucleus and the negatively charged electron. It's just like with magnets. You know that if you take um, a couple of magnets and you put the north pole of one magnet next to the south pole of another magnet, they attract each other like this. Same thing with electricity. Opposite charges attract each other. And in fact, that happens to be uh, one of the laws that we use in electronics. It, it happens to be called, and you don't really have to know this, it happens to be called the first law of electrostatics. The first law of electrostatics states that opposite charges attract. Opposites attract. Opposite charges attract. And again, it's just like it is with magnets. Opposite poles of a magnet attract, north pole and south pole. Opposite char electrical charges attract as well. Yo, glad you could make it, Mo. Mel. Sorry. Mel, Mo. You could be Mo, but you're not. Uh, where are you going to sit? You're going to sit right here, buddy.
<clears throat> so opposites attract just like opposite magnets attract. So for instance, if I try to put uh, a negatively charged electron next to something that's positively charged, those guys are going to attract each other. Now just the opposite is true. If I try to put two of the same pole together, they'll repel each other. If I try to put two north poles together or two south poles of a magnet, they will repel each other. Same thing with electricity. If I try to put, let's say, two negative charges next to each other, instead of attracting, they'll repel each other. Same thing, if I try to put two positive charges together, they will repel each other, they won't attract. And we'll talk more about this as we go through the class. In fact, everything I'm going over now is going to be amplified as we go through the rest of the class. But what I want you to see here, the most important thing is these electrons. These tiny little electrons, these little subatomic particles with a negative charge. We can do things with these electrons. There's all kinds of things we can do with electrons, and this is what we're going to be dealing with this whole week. Um, for instance, um, uh, if I connect a, uh, a battery and a lamp, the battery is like a pump for electrons. Instead of pumping water, it pumps electrons. And the electrons come out of the battery, they go through this wire, and the electrons go through the very thin filament in the lamp. This, the thing that's glowing inside the lamp is tungsten. It's incredibly thin. As billions and billions of electrons try to rush through this very thin filament of the lamp, friction causes it to get hot. It's friction, just like when you rub your hands together and your hands get hot, uh, it's the same thing here. What causes the, the lamp to glow is friction, friction between these electrons, these tiny little subatomic particles and the very skinny uh, little filament in the lamp um, causes friction and, and it's the friction that causes the lamp to glow. We can do other things with these things, with electrons. For instance, um, we'll see later on that in the monitor there's this thing called an electron gun. And, and I'll show you this closely later on. The electron gun, as the name implies, shoots out a stream of these electrons. That's what makes something glow on the front of the screen. What makes the picture is electrons shooting out of an electron gun, hitting the front of the screen and making light on the front of the screen. Uh, we can run electrons through a, a speaker and make the speaker make sound. We can uh, shoot electrons at the light bulbs, at the, at the fluorescent lights, and make the fluorescent lights glow. There's just millions of things that we can do with electrons. So this this is what we're going to be going over this whole week. When we talk about electronics, what we're talking about is these tiny little subatomic particles, these little electrons. Everybody with me so far? The most important thing is that you realize that these electrons are not imaginary things. They're real physical particles. I think of electrons as like little BBs, basically, little negatively charged grape shot or little tiny BBs. I mean, they're really itty bitty, but they are real physical, physical things. Now, when we have a setup like this with uh, a battery and a lamp. Uh, this is called a circuit, an electronic circuit. And we can show what the circuit looks like in the form of a schematic diagram. If you turn in your blue book, if you look in your blue book, actually the blue book is set up in, in a couple of different sections. Um, the front of the blue book is all the, the text and then right in the middle of it there starts the reference section. And all the parts in the reference section start with the letter R, R1, R2, R3, and so on. The schematic symbols are on page R1 and R2. The schematic symbols are supposed to kind of represent what the part is or, or, or what it does. And the schematic symbol for a battery looks like this. Long line, a short line, a long line, a short line like this. And the long line is the positive side of the battery. Now, any multi-cell battery is drawn like this. And uh, in this case, this six-volt battery here, uh, there's actually four individual cells inside this battery, four individual cells. If I were to draw 
the schematic diagram or the schematic symbol for a single cell, like a flashlight, like a, like a B cell in a flashlight, uh, it would just look like this. But any, any battery that's more than a volt and a half will, will be shown like this. To show you what the voltage is of the battery, it will generally be labeled off to one side like this. In this case, it's a six volt battery. So that's the schematic symbol for the battery. The schematic symbol for the lamp looks like that. It looks a lot like a lamp. The, the circle is the glass envelope of the lamp and the little curly Q inside is the, the filament. And then of course connecting the two together we have, you know, we have these wires here. And the schematic symbol for a wire is extremely complex. Just a line like that. And when we have all this stuff hooked up, we have what is known as a circuit, C-I-R-C-U-I-T, or in Spanish, circuito, as I just got back from Mexico City, so I'm still thinking like Spanish. Okay, now, in order to have a circuit, you really have to have four things going for you. This is pretty important. In order to have a circuit, and this is actually technically called a complete circuit, you really need to have four things. Number one, you have to have what we call the source. The source of power. Remember I mentioned that a battery is like a pump. Is like a pump for electrons. Instead of pumping water, it pumps electrons. Obviously, if we're going to get electrons to move through a circuit, something has to be pushing them through the circuit. You have to have some, just like water, you need a pump to pump water through a circuit. Electricity is the same way. You need to have something, some source of power. And in this case, the source of power is this battery. The source of power could be like the AC wall receptacle. The source of power could be a power supply like this one is, power supply from a game. Whatever the, so, the, the power source could be a windmill or, or anything. Anything that's providing the push for the, uh, for the electrons is called the source. Then you need to have something that's, that's using the power from the source. If I just have a battery like this with nothing else connected to it, this is not a circuit. This is just the source. In order to have a complete circuit, you have to have something that's going to use the power from the source. And we call that the load. The load is anything that's going to use the power from the source. The load, uh, in this case, is a light bulb. But in a video game or a pinball machine, the load is like the logic board. Or in a pinball, also the load would be the coils. There's another load in the, that are, that's the coils. And it's a whole separate circuit, actually. So you need to have a source and you need to have a load. But you need two other things as well. You need to have a way to get the power from the source to the load. You need to have some kind of a conductor, some kind of a wire, some kind of a piece of metal, something that's going to conduct the electricity. And we call that the source path. The source path, the path that the electricity is going to follow as it goes from the source to the load is called the source path. But you wouldn't expect anything to light up with just one wire hooked up. I mean, obviously, if I have my, my battery here, I connect the positive lead to the battery, goes to the light bulb, but I don't have anything hooked up, obviously the light bulb's not going to be on. So you need not only a way to get the power from the source to the load, in this case the light bulb, but you also have to have a way to bring the electric current back from the load back to the source to get the thing to light up. So we need not only the source path, But we also need the path that brings the electric current back from the load to the source. This is very important. This is known as the return path. We're going to talk a lot about source path and return path as we go through the class. 
And when we have all of these things, when you have the source, <coughs> the load, the source path, and the return path, you have what we call a complete circuit. In order to have a complete circuit, you need to have all these things working for you. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't expect this thing to, 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 to light up if there was just one wire hooked up. And all these things are a complete circuit. According to the schematic diagram, according to the way the schematic diagrams are drawn, electric current flows from positive to negative on the schematic diagrams. The way the schematics are drawn, electric current flows from positive to negative. Huh? Well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute now. I just got finished saying that electricity is these electrons, and these electrons are little, get over here, are little negatively charged things. If, an, if electricity is these little negatively charged electrons, and opposite charges attract each other, electricity really should be going from negative to positive, shouldn't it? When you think about it, I mean, that's what an electron is. And yet, according to the schematic diagram, electric current flows from positive to negative. Well, there's a reason why. And the reason why is that it's only in the beginning of the, 19, of the 20th century, I should say, that we discovered what electricity really is, that we discover what the electron is and all that jazz. But they've been drawing schematics for hundreds of years. I mean, even Benjamin Franklin did a lot of experimenting with electricity. You know, the kite flying experiment where he flew the kite in the storm and, you know, lightning hit the kite and he touched the key at the end of the kite wire and ah, shot the shit out of himself. Oh, lightning's electricity. Hey, no shit, Ben. You know, but he, but he did a lot of experimenting with electricity. Get over here. I don't, I'm not sure why it's doing that, actually. I think the fluorescent lights are messing it up. Anyway, it's got a mind of its own. Yeah, hi, how are you? Okay. Uh, anyway, Ben did a lot of experimenting with electricity, and he also drew schematic diagrams. Well, what they thought electricity was in the beginning was some kind of weird invisible fluid. They thought that electricity was some mysterious invisible fluid, and they thought that some things had too much of this invisible fluid, and they called those things positive. And they thought that some other things didn't have enough of this weird invisible fluid, and they called those things negative. And they said electricity flows from positive to negative, and so they started drawing schematic diagrams that way. Well, when we discovered hundreds of years later that electricity is really these negatively charged electrons, they did not change the way they draw schematic diagrams. Schematic diagrams are still drawn kind of fast backwards. Schematic diagrams are drawn as if electricity was some kind of invisible fluid and it flowed from positive to negative. Now this, this, this concept of electricity flowing from positive to negative is known as conventional current. Conventional current. It ain't really the way the electric current flows, but it's, it's the way we draw the schematic diagram. And so throughout this class, almost without exception, when we're discussing electric current flow and we're discussing how things work on, in schematic diagrams and so on, We'll be talking about electric current in terms of conventional current, this concept that electricity flows from, from positive to negative. Now, it really doesn't. Electric current really flows from negative to positive. But since all the schematics are drawn this way, this is the way we need to look at it. Also, it makes it much easier to understand how electricity works. Because when you look at electric current as, as flowing from positive to negative, it works the same way that water does. Everybody knows water flows from a higher altitude to a lower altitude. Same thing with electric current. It flows from a higher voltage to a lower voltage. And we'll talk a bunch about that as we go through the class. I guarantee you this is really very simple. Uh, so as far as we're concerned, when you look at electric current, electric current flows from positive to negative. It would come out the positive side of the battery, through the load, that's the source path, and then the return path is, is back to the negative side of the battery. Does that make sense? And as long as we have these four things, 
we have a complete circuit. The source, the source path, the load, the return path, we have a complete circuit. If something happens and the circuit is broken somewhere, let's say the source path has a break in it, we no longer have a complete circuit. If the source path is broken, this is now known as an open circuit. An open circuit. And in an open circuit, there is no flow of electric current. Obviously, if I break this connection somewhere, I'm not going to get any, any, any light to light up. You know, complete circuit, obviously, if I break the connection somewhere, like break the source path here, open circuit, no current flows. If any current was flowing, obviously the light bulb would light up. Well, if I break the source path, I have an open circuit. But if I break the return path, don't I have the exact same thing? When you think about it, if I break the return path, the light bulb still ain't going to light up. And back to that old thing, nothing lights up with just one wire hooked up. So it doesn't matter where I break the current flow. If I break the source path, no current flow. If I break the return path, no matter where I break it, I can break it down here at the battery, no matter where I break it, the light bulb goes off. Okay? So if we have an open circuit, there is no current flow whatsoever. This is just the opposite of a short circuit. For instance, if I connect some, like a, a metal blade, like a, you know, let's just take this knife blade for instance, across the terminals of the battery. I'm just putting it right across the terminals of the battery. The light bulb goes off. I'm going to pull it up so you can see it. Why? Well, obviously it's much easier for the electrons to go through this nice thick knife blade than it is for them to try to squeeze through the really skinny filament of the lamp. The electrons will take the path of least resistance, I guess you would say. When I have, when I have this, what the hell was that? Oh. I thought something was blowing up on me. And I, thought, and I knew I had unplugged Vigilante, so I couldn't figure out what the hell it was. Um, if something happens and I end up with a direct path right across a source like this, this is not an open circuit anymore. This is now a short circuit. And in a short circuit, generally you have excessive current flow. That's usually what blows fuses when you have a when you have some kind of a short circuit. So we can have a complete circuit, normal, everyday, everything's working hunky-dory, complete circuit. If, if the path is broken somewhere, we have an open circuit, no current flows, or if we have a direct path right across the source, we have a short circuit. The reason I point this out is that a lot of people just automatically assume that any failure that they have is a short circuit. Like they equate short circuit with bad, like they mean the same thing. Like you go to a location and, and, and they'll be pointing to the pinball and they'll go, hey, uh, that, uh, that number five bonus light doesn't light up. It must have a short in it. Well, bullshit, it's probably open, isn't it? The, the filament of the lamp is probably broken. It probably has an open circuit. So don't think that any, any failure is a short circuit. Some components, when they fail, do short circuit. I'll show you that diodes, there's a part called a diode we'll look at, for instance, that always short circuits. When it fails, it's always a dead short. It's very easy to find. Transistors sometimes short. Sometimes they open circuit. Uh, resistors, we'll look at a part called a resistor shortly, that all, it always opens circuits. That's all it ever does when it fails. So we're going to look at both these types of failures, short circuits and open circuits. Just remember that in a short circuit you have excess current flow, there is no nothing stopping the flow of electric current. Uh, with an open circuit, if you have a break in the wire somewhere or a break in the component, no electric current goes through at all. That's an open. Everybody with me so far? Okay? Pretty simple, right? But a lot of people make that mistake. They just, they say that anything that's bad is, is shorted, and that's not necessarily true. 
Well, before we go too much further then, let's take a look at some of these terms that we use in electronics. And a lot of the terms that we use in electronics are, are kind of weird because they're named after people. They're named after early pioneers in, in electronics and stuff like that. In fact, they're named after dead guys, basically. So, so let's learn some of these dead guy terms. And one of the first terms that we want to cover is the term voltage. Voltage is our electrical term for pressure. Our electrical measurement for pressure. Now, if I was talking about water, talking about water pressure, what's our what's our unit of water pressure? Pounds per pressure. Yeah, psi, pounds per square inch, right? Sure, psi. Um, voltage. Our unit is the volt. Voltage is measured in volts. One volt, two or more volts, pretty simple. Uh, in this case, uh, named after a guy named Alessandro Volta. Uh, he's an Italian guy, and he's the guy that invented the battery. Like hundreds of years ago, invented the chemical battery. Um, and so we measure, we measure voltage or pressure in volts. Uh, for instance, um, that six volt battery, this has, whoa, hey, oh, hey. The Florence lights. That's it, fluorescent lights. Have a nice trip. See you next fall. Okay, uh, this is a uh, this is a six volt battery. It has six volts of electrical pressure. And since this is a six volt lamp, uh, I'm all discombobulated now. Since this is a six volt lamp, it glows pretty normally because it's got a six volt battery attached to it. Uh, your car battery, on the other hand, is probably 12 volts. It has twice as much pressure. If I were to connect this 6 volt lamp to the 12 volt car battery, it would glow like really incredibly bright for a short time and then it would burn out, obviously. Uh, so the, the higher the voltage is, the more pressure you have. The, uh, the uh, power from the AC wall receptacle down here is 120 volts. Yeah, cause. This is 120 volts coming out of the wall receptacle, 10 times what comes out of your car battery, 10 times the pressure. On the other hand, all of the games that we use, all of the integrated circuits, or almost every integrated circuit in every game you work on, requires 5 volts DC to operate. Most of you are probably familiar with this because your power supply has a 5 volt output, and, and uh, this is very critical. We'll talk more about this. We'll talk a lot about this, in fact, because this has to be very exact. The 5 volts DC can only vary plus or minus a quarter of a volt before we start to see problems. That's one of the reasons... In fact, it's almost the main reason, not really though, uh, why you want to have a digital multimeter so that you can check it accurately because that 5 volts really has to be accurate. We'll talk a lot about that as we go through the class. You can imagine what would happen if you ran 120 volts of pressure into the 5 volt logic board. I mean, the, the extra pressure literally blows the tops off of all the ICs on the board. It's really, you know how I know that? Because <laughs> it happened to me once. It was really a disaster. Uh, just, just bam, just craters all the chips. And, and uh, of course, that makes troubleshooting easy, doesn't it? You just replace everything, and, and that's it. It's a terrible, horrible thing to have happen. In fact, we'll talk more about this. Uh, there's a, there's um, a type of a transformer that you'll use in every game called an isolation transformer. It's a safety transformer. And without this isolation transformer, there's a possibility of putting 120 volts on your logic board. This is a, like a real common problem in Mexico, apparently. They go, well, I don't need no sinking transformer, and they don't put it on there and that blows stuff up. So, so this thing is nothing more than a converter. Well, we'll talk about it in great detail coming up. Uh, it's an isolator. It isolates everything from the AC power line. We'll, I'll give you the straight poop as we go through this thing. I'm just trying to introduce you to some, some, some different terms now. So uh, one of the things that we use our meter for is to measure voltage. And it's, it's probably what most of you are, the only thing you're using your meter for right now is to check the 5 volt power supply maybe um, or to see if you have AC power coming from the wall receptacle but there's lots of other things that you can use the meter for as you'll see later on. So voltage measured in volts that's one of the things that we that our meter will measure.
The next term is current. And current is defined as the flow of electricity. Just like current in a river is the flow of water in a river, so too the flow of electrons, or actually since we're talking about conventional current, let's just call it the flow of electricity, um, is called current. And our unit of current is the ampere, A-M-P-E-R-E. That's -E. uh, uh, another dead guy. In this case, the, and the guy's name is Andre Ampere, one of your countrymen, Claude. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't really know what the hell he did, to be honest with you. He's some kind of electronic genius. I don't know. Um, but current is measured in amperes, but nobody says amperes. Everybody just says amps for short. Amps, A-M-P. One amp, two or more amps. Uh, if you say amperes, people look at you like you're, like you're really strange. So current is measured in amps. Uh, current is the flow of electricity in a circuit. How much actual flow is there in, in a circuit? Um, now, although the meter can measure amperes, we never actually, or measure amps, we never actually have to do it when we're working on games. There's never any reason whatsoever, as far as diagnostic tool is concerned, for us to ever measure current when we're working on games. So uh, we never have to do it. In fact, the only time that I've ever even measured electric current in a game is uh, just out of curiosity to see how much electric current a game maybe draws from the from the wall receptacle or <clears throat> how much electric current a logic board might draw from a power supply. Um, and by the way, uh, your average video game only draws about an amp and a half to two amps out of the AC power receptacle. This is especially important for those of you that work in arcades or are setting up arcades. How many games can you put on one circuit breaker? Well, if you have a 20 amp breaker, obviously, if you put 10 on there, you'll be fine, 10 or less. So, what do you, you guys have, like a mess of them loaded up on a circuit breaker or something in your place? No, um, we got two geared up with um, 220. 220s, 220 amp yeah. breakers. Oh, okay. Not not 220 volts. Okay. <laughs> Scare me there. I go, 220, what? What are you doing? So, okay. Yeah, fire sale. Yeah, really. Well, this happened to me a couple of times. I, I worked in England for about a year. And uh, when people would send us, when we get equipment like from the United States, uh, a lot of it came wired from 110. And we had to be very, very careful that we didn't plug it right into the wall, blow it up. Anyway, so uh, voltage we will measure with our meter. Current we don't have to measure with the meter. And then there's one other term we want to look at, resistance. Resistance is defined as... The opposition to the flow. The opposition to the flow of electric current. Now that's, ooh, 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 that's really complicated. Here's what I really mean by that, though. Imagine that I'm out in my backyard and I'm watering my garden out there, I'm watering my petunias out there or something. And, and of course, the amount of water that comes out of the end of the hose is determined by the, you know, the, the, the spigot over here, you, the pressure at the spigot. You turn on the spigot or the faucet or whatever you want to call it and the, the water comes out. If someone comes along and kinks the hose, it's harder for the water to get through that kink, right? That's a resistance. That's slowing the water down. What happens to the amount of water coming out the end of the hose? Trickles. It trickles, a lot less, right? So the more resistance you have, the less current you have flowing in a circuit. Uh, everything has a certain amount of resistance. Uh, you know, for instance... Uh -oh. oh come back over here. For instance, thank you. Uh, obviously, the filament in this lamp has a certain amount of resistance. It's harder for the electrons to get through the skinny little filament of the lamp than it is through the wires. So the lamp must have some resistance. Now the wires aren't glowing like this. The wires aren't glowing because they're thick enough that they can handle 
the amount of current that's going through them. But of course, if I tried to jump start my car with these little clip leads, they probably would look like that, wouldn't they? <laughs> because the starter motor in a car draws hundreds of amps of current, and uh, and it would just it would just fry them just completely. So, uh, so now theoretically, a wire theoretically a wire has no resistance, a theoretical wire. But we know, of course, that they must have resistance. That's why you use thick wires for some things and thinner for others because you need to draw more current, let's say, for the starter in a car. And, and we'll see later on when we do when we take a look at conversion kits and how to hook up uh, games that uh, to carry the five volts uh, from the power supply to the logic board, you want to use several wires. You want to use three or four wires because they'll have less resistance that way and it will enable the electric current to flow much more easily. So resistance is defined as anything that opposes the flow of electric current in a circuit and resistance is measured in ohms. O-H-M. One ohm, two or more ohms. In this case, uh, named after a guy named George Simon Ohm. And I don't know what he did either. <laughs> but uh, this is another one of these dead guy terms. I guess eventually we'll have the Elvis, but I'm not sure what that's going to be. So uh, anyway, so uh, and resistance is the other, another thing that we'll measure with the meter. We have a symbol that we use for ohms. And that is this symbol right here. It's the Greek letter omega. The little Greek letter omega. See the little Greek letter omega there on your meter? And that indicates that this is the place for ohms. This is where you set your meter for ohms. Right there. So we will measure voltage with our meter. And there's volts. This is called volts DC. Volts AC, which we'll, we'll talk about the difference in just a minute here. And we will use our meter to measure volts. We will not use the meter to measure current, to measure amps at all. We're never going to use that amp setting. Even though it's there and we could do it, we're not going to ever do it. And then this is where the meter would be set for ohms. It failed miserably. Let's go back to that. Uh, let's go back to this circuit that we looked at previously with the battery and the lamp, this complete circuit. And remember I said that electric current flows from positive to negative. In this circuit, our source of power, our source is DC. It is direct current, yeah. The definition of direct current is current that flows only in one direction, only from positive to negative. A battery is a pure source of direct current. In the battery, the electric current flows only in one direction. It comes out this red lead through the red wire, through the lamp, back down. The return path is through the black lead, back to the battery again, only in one direction direct current. Let's replace the DC source with an AC source. And an AC source would generally just be indicated with a circle and this little squiggle in the middle like this. And we're going to talk a lot more about this little squiggle. This little squiggle means alternating current. It happens to be <clears throat> called a sine wave, but I'll, I'll tell you more about that later on, so don't worry about it for now. But this would be alternating current, or AC. <clears throat> and the difference between AC and DC is that alternating current is constantly changing direction. Alternating current goes in one direction for a short time, and then it goes back in the other direction. Alternating current is constantly changing direction. It's constantly changing polarity. First it goes this way, and in this case our AC power coming out of the wall is 60 cycles per second. So it goes this way for 120th of a second, then it goes back for 120th of a second. That's one cycle. We'll talk a lot about this later on. It goes this way for a short time, 
It's 120th of a second, and then it comes back again. So the difference between DC and AC is that DC, the current flows only in one direction. In AC, <clears throat> first that side's positive and that side's negative, and the current flows this way. Then the polarity reverses, and the current flows the opposite direction. That's the difference between AC and DC. When we're making voltage tests, as we'll do, quite, uh, not quite often, as we'll do occasionally. Uh, actually, I'm going to show you many ways to test things without the power on at all, which is really the preferable way to test things safely, no shocks, power off. Um, but when we check things like direct current, and you're checking voltage with your meter, your meter does have two leads. It has a red lead and it has a black lead. The black lead goes into a jack marked common, C-O-M for common. We have a reference point that we use when we're making DC measurements and it's called ground. It's called ground. Ground is our zero volt point. When we're making DC voltage measurements, we almost always put the black meter lead on ground. In fact, when, there's many, many cases I'll show you where we'll put the black meter lead on ground. And in fact, I'll even show you one where we'll put the red meter lead on ground, but that's a kind of an interesting and unique test. But whenever we're making voltage checks, we'll almost always put the, the black lead on ground. Ground is our zero volt reference point. It's just like, let's say we're talking about a pilot, and the pilot's flying around and he, and he calls his, traf his altitude into an air traffic controller. He doesn't give his altitude above the earth, does he? Because that's always changing. He'll go over a mountain or whatever. What does he use? Well, he uses sea level, right? Sea level, right. Or sea level is, like ground is our electronic sea level, basically. And we have a couple of different schematic symbols that we'll use, several actually, that we'll use for ground. One of them, and the most common one that you'll see, looks like this. Kind of forms like a, uh, an arrow that always points down to the bottom of the schematic uh, diagram. This is called an earth ground. It's called an earth ground because when you see this ground symbol, it is somewhere, anything electrically connected to this symbol, is somewhere actually electrically connected to the earth itself. You know that if you look at the, you know, our AC power distribution, it looks like this. And there's a, a short slot and a longer slot and then this half round guy. And this is an earth ground. Somewhere in the building, this, is, this, this third round pin is supposed to be connected to like a cold water pipe that's buried in the ground or perhaps a steel rod that's pounded into the ground. Somewhere, the earth itself is our zero volt reference point. Uh, and so that's the, that's the earth ground. And of course, it's zero volts. In fact, the other, the long slot is also zero volts. It's called the neutral, N-E-U-T-R-A-L. It's called the neutral side. That's also zero volts. Theoretically, I should be able to stand with wet feet on wet concrete and stick my tongue in that long slot and not get a shock off of it. Uh, on the other hand, the short slot is what we call the hot side. And that's the side that has the 120 volts AC on it. Whenever you set a new, um, when you set a new uh, location or a new, well, a new street location or a new arcade, it's really a good idea to check the AC power to make sure that it's properly grounded and everything's hooked up right. Um, when you check from the hot side to neutral, you should get 120 volts AC there. When you check from the hot side to ground, you should also get 120 volts AC. If you check from the hot side to ground and you get something like 40 or 50 or 60 volts AC, you have no ground at all. It's floating. The ground is floating. This can be dangerous because you no longer have a safety ground. And, and sometimes the effect will be you'll touch two rails of two different pinballs and you'll get a shock. Or, uh, or even just touch the control panel of a game if you're wearing bare, if you have, if you're wearing no shoes, I should say, if you're if you're wearing bare feet, uh, and uh, and and you might also get a shock. Also, when the game's not grounded, uh, all kinds of weird electrical impulses can get into the game. It can blow logic boards. It can blow power supplies. This is a real problem in Mexico. 
real bad problem down there and ain't nothing grounded properly in Mexico, nothing. And, and so you can get shocks off all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, here in the United States, it's not really so much of a problem. Anyway, so Earth ground is, is zero volts and it's actually connected to the Earth itself. You, uh, you will see me draw a kind of a shorthand version of this same Earth ground symbol. I'll often draw it like this because it's a lot faster. These two mean the exact same thing. They mean this is exactly the same as this. It always points down to the bottom of the page. Earth ground. Well, you know how in, uh, in most vehicles you have a 12-volt car battery, and you know how the negative side of the car battery is connected right to the chassis of the car? It's called negative ground. If you lift the hood of any car and look at the car battery, the negative side of the car battery will be connected through a real thick wire, and it will go right to like the engine block or the chassis or something like that. It's what they call a negative ground system. But in your car, the car is up on four rubber tires. That ground cannot be an earth ground. There's no possible way. It's not touching the earth at all. So we have a separate kind of a ground. It's called a chassis ground. Chassis ground. And the chassis ground is a different symbol. It looks like this. It is still zero volts. It's still zero volts. But it's zero volts, it's not connected to uh, the actual Earth itself. And when we start looking at the monitor schematics, you'll see that the ground symbols are all chassis ground symbols for reasons which I'll explain later on when we start looking at monitors. Uh, so either of these things are zero volts. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, now one more thing before we take a break. Let's go back to our car here, automobile. Here's the 12 volt car battery. The negative side is connected to the chassis ground. There's the positive side, 12 volt battery. Goes out here, and let's say it goes to my radio or something. There's the, the DC power going into the radio. That's the source path, isn't it, right? The, the path from the source to the load, which in this case is my radio. My source is the battery, load is the radio. Well, remember, I need to have a return path for a complete circuit, and the return path is back to ground like this. Can everybody see that by putting a ground symbol here and a ground symbol here, it's electrically exactly the same thing as if I were to draw a wire in between the two? I mean, ground is simply just the metal part of the car chassis. It's a big, giant, fat wire, obviously. So, so that's pretty obvious, but this is actually an important concept. Ground is the same everywhere. When I draw ground in two or maybe even more different places, like, for instance, it not only goes to the radio, but there's also, I've got a CB rig, right? That side of that would also be grounded, right? That's the return path. The current flows into the radio, but current also flows into the CB. The return is back through ground. There's lots and lots of things in, well, in anything, in a, in a video game, a monitor, a pinball, whatever. There's lots of things that are connected to ground. And instead of having a, a, a wire going back to a central ground, which would be really complicated and the schematic diagram would be a mess. Instead, they put a ground symbol everywhere that it goes to ground. But everybody can see that these are all connected together, correct? All right. In order to, uh, in order to make circuits work, they do have to have, certain parts of the circuits have to have a certain amount of resistance. And uh, to get that certain amount of resistance, we have these parts called resistors. And that's the parts that I've given to you, and and uh, and I'll be giving you some more as we as we go through this <clears throat> later on. Turn in your handbook and in, in your big blue book of really swell technical information to page R three, I think it is. R. Schematic symbol for a resistor looks like this, just a zigzaggy line like that. <clears throat> Thank you. 
in games, we use parts, we use resistors with a, a very wide range. In games, we have resistors that are as little as one-tenth of an ohm. And we also have resistors that are one million ohms, or even more than that. So we have a very wide range of resistances. In fact, there's one monitor that, that we use. It happens to be the monitor that's in the vigilante game there, and also this one under the table, that has a 2.2 million ohm resistor. But the size of the resistor has nothing to do with how many ohms it is. Now, I've handed out some resistors to you, and um, hopefully you have different resistors, but these resistors um, can be any number of different ohms, and yet they're all the same size. If you look at, the, at these teeny weeny little resistors here, First thing you'll notice is that there is there are no numbers printed anywhere on this resistor. In order to tell what the value of the resistor is, we have this thing called the resistor color code. The resistor color code. And it's real important that you know the resistor color code. You don't necessarily have to memorize it, but you just do, you do have to know the resistor color code. And the color code is there on page R2 and uh, also on page R3. Each color <coughs> represents a number. For instance, zero is represented by black. Get a different pen here. One is brown. Two is red. These are in ascending chromatic scale. That is, they're the same way a rainbow is set up, if you know how that works. Three is orange. Four is yellow. Five is green. Six is blue. Seven is violet. Eight is gray. And nine is white. Now, if you look carefully at your resistor, you'll see that there are actually four bands on it. Now, it may be extremely difficult for you to see those, those bands. These resistors are pretty damn tiny. Um, and it may also, for, for the men in this room, it may be difficult for you to tell what some of the colors are because uh, men have a problem with color blindness that women don't. So you can you can ask Shirley or Susan when we get later on into this thing what what colors your resistors are. But if you look carefully at your resistor, you will see that one of the bands is gold. One of the bands at one end is gold. We're going to start talking about the resistor at the other end. We're going to start talking about the resistor at the end opposite the gold band. So let's take a look. Let's say we have a resistor that is, let's say, blue is the first band and green is the second and red is the third band. Forget about the fourth band for the moment, the, the gold band. We'll start with the other side. Well, how many ohms is this? Let's see. The first band is blue, so that's six. So we'll write down the number six. The second one is green. Green is five. Write down the number five. And the third band is red. That's two. This is not a 652 ohm resistor. Okay? This is really important. In a resistor, the third band of the resistor is technically called the multiplier band. It's called the multiplier band. Ooh, what the hell does that mean? Well, all it really means is that this third band tells you the number of zeros to put after the first two digits. In other words, it's telling you to multiply times 10, add one zero. 100, add two zeros. Multiply by 1,000, add three zeros, and so on. Blue, green, red. 
Blue is six, green is five. The red, the third band, is telling me how many zeros to put after the first two. How many should I put there? Two, two zeros. This is a 6500 ohm, and there's that Greek letter omega. This is a 6500 ohm resistor. Okay. We don't know what a K is. Um, this is a 6500 ohm resistor. Um, the third band has to be the multiplier because, remember I said that we have resistors that are a million ohms or so. If the third band was not the multiplier, if you just wrote down the number it was, what would be the largest value in ohms you could have with three bands? 999 ohms. Yeah, 999 ohms. So unless you want to have a resistor that's this long just so you can put all the zeros in there, somehow you have to do it a different way. And so this is the way we do it. The third band is the multiplier band. We're going to go through a bunch of these things and then we're going to do a little resistor lab in just a second so that we'll have a, a good idea of how this works because it's real important to know the color code. All right, let's say that we have a resistor like uh, this one. Let's see, grab another color here. Let's say we have a resistor that is... Um, I only have four colors, so we're going to have to fake this. <laughs> let's say we have a resistor that's green, red, orange. Beautiful orange, all right. All right, green is five, red, orange, three. 523 ohms, right? No, Randy, you dumb shit. What is it? It's three, three zeros, right? One, two, three, 52,000 ohms. Okay, let's do a couple more. Let me just, uh, instead of trying to find the color here, let's, let's, let's say we have one that is, uh, oh, let's say we have one that's yellow, violet, uh, yellow. Uh, yellow? Four. Violet? Seven. Yellow? Four. Four more zeros, right? One, two, three, four, 470,000 ohms. Don't try to do this in your head because it's very easy to slip up and lose a zero or something somewhere. For instance, you might have a resistor like this that's brown, black, yellow. When, instead of trying to do this in your head, look at it and say to yourself, okay, brown. Brown is one, black, black is, black is zero, yellow is four. Four zeros, one, two, three, four, and then put the comma in and see what the hell you have. Because, because it's very easy to drop a zero or add one accidentally, especially when you get into something with a large number of zeros. So don't agonize over it, just write it down. Just write down whatever, whatever it happens to be. Let's say we have one like this. Let's say we have one that's red, violet, let's go, let's go nuts. Red, violet, green, all right? What's red? Two. Violet, seven. seven. Green, five. five more zeros. One, two, three, four, five. See, 2,700,000 ohms, all right? So it is actually very simple once you've done it a few times, and we're going to have a chance to do a bunch of them here. All right, now put on your thinking caps. How about this one? Suppose we have one that is brown, black, black. Brown, black, black. What do you suppose brown, black, black is? What do you think? One ohm? Anybody think anything else? 100 ohms? Anybody think anything else? Point what? What was that, Dan? 10 ohms? All right, how many think it's 1 ohm? How many think it's 10 ohms? How many think it's 100 ohms? Who thinks it's 10? Okay, 10 ohms is correct. 10 ohms is correct. Let's see why. This is kind of, this is a tricky thing, but there's a reason why I point this out to you. Okay, brown is 1. We got that. That's easy. Black is 0. Okay, the third band is telling you the number of zeros to put after the first two. How many? None. Zeros. Don't put no freaking zeros back there. It's black. This is a 10 ohm resistor. 
If that third band is black, it's saying don't put no zeros back there, none whatsoever. You do put the second one in there. That's normal. That's a significant digit, as they would say. But the multiplier says don't put any zeros back there. Here's why this is important. You need to pay attention. This is very important. Let's say that you let's say that you were working on something and for some reason you found this resistor. I'll get it. Fine, just fine. I'll do it. <laughs> All right. Let's say let's say you're working on something and you see this resistor. Resistors, by the way, are the last thing that you test. Resistors hardly ever fail. I'm covering them first, but they they hardly ever fail. But let's say for some reason you're working on something and you see this resistor and it's brown, black, black, and you think to yourself it's 100 ohms. Most people think it's 100 because they go 100 zero, zero, and they think it's 100 ohms. I'm really surprised that so many of you thought it was one. Um, and they get to the thing, they see this resistor, and for some reason they want to check it. So they, they put their meter on ohms, as we'll do in just a little bit. They put their meter leads across the resistor, and the meter doesn't read 100 ohms, it only reads 10 ohms, which is what it really is, right? They go, oh, I'm a genius, I found it, this resistor's partially shorted. It's supposed to be 100 ohms, it's only 10 ohms. So you boogie over to Radio Shack, and you get a 100 ohm resistor to put in there. You may not notice that the colors are different. You know, it would be brown, black, brown, wouldn't it? If it was 100 ohms, it would be brown, black, brown. So you may not notice that the colors are different. You go ahead and replace that 10 ohm resistor with the 100 ohm resistor. Obviously, when you turn the thing back on, it doesn't fix anything, does it? Because you've not only changed the good part, but you've changed one with a part that's the wrong value, right? You made it worse because even if you eventually find which part is actually bad, you may never get it to work because this new resistor you put in there is 10 times the value it should be. So here's, here's why I point this out to you, and this is really important. It has to do with the, the way things fail. When a resistor fails, it always open circuits. It goes way up in resistance. When a resistor fails, it never goes down in resistance. In fact, the only time you would ever see a resistor that was lower is if you look at the board and it's just a little chunk of carbon or charcoal sitting on the board, obviously all flamed out, in which case you'd find it by looking at it, wouldn't you? Visual inspection, by the way, is critically important. It's really important to look at jazz. I find about half my problems just by looking at them. That's why if you're in a dark location, it's really important that you have a good trouble light. You know, this business of, of, of you know, uh, you got the pen light flashlight in your mouth like this and you're trying to work or something like this and you, you know, that's nonsense. You really have to have a good strong light to be able to see what you're doing. But, but again, when resistors fail, they always go way up in resistance or infinite resistance. So like, let's say you, you have a resistor that's supposed to be 400 ohm, 470 ohms, let's say, and it's bad, it will be open. You'll put your meter leads across it, your meter will read an infinite resistance. And we're going to do a, a resistor lab in just a few minutes here so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, you will never ever see a shorted resistor, never look for one. It will always go way up in resistance. So, does that make sense so far about the color code? Now, they do have these little gadgets that you can get at Radio Shack, these little thumb wheels that you can rotate to, uh, to line up the colors, and it tells you what the value of, of the resistor is. It's really hardly necessary. Uh, it's important that you remember the color code, though, and there's a few little jingles that you can use to remember the color code. Um, these are the first letter of each word of the jingle is the first letter of the color. For instance, there's, there's three that I know of. There's a really clean one that I learned in Boy Scouts. <laughs> That's better be ready or your great big venture goes west. <laughs> better be ready or your great big venture goes west. That's kind of queer. I, you know, it's kind of stupid. <laughs> but uh, if you're the drinking type, I got a good one for you. Bad beer rots our young guts, but vodka goes well. That's a good one. Bad beer rots our young guts, but vodka goes well. But the one most people remember is bad boys. Okay, Howard, settle down. Bad bad boys rape our young girls, but Violet gives willingly. 
I, I suppose in today's climate of, of, of uh, awareness, that's probably not such a good one. To, but bad boys rape our young girls, but Violet gives willingly. So if you remember those, that's the first letter of, of the color code. Anyway. Uh, anyway. And if you want to remember it in Spanish, it's negro, café, rojo, naranja, amarillo, verde, azul, violeta, gris, in blanco. Correct? Ooh, all right. Pretty cool. Huh? I learned that in Mexico City last wow. time. So rico suave. All right. All right. So anyway. Now, remember I said that we use some very large values for resistors in the thousands and the millions. And so we have a kind of a shortcut that we use when we're talking about large values. Something called a metric prefix, which you probably already know what this is, even though you don't know that it's called this. Uh, for instance, we use the metric prefix kilo. Kilo, of course, means times 1,000. A kilometer is 1,000 meters. A uh, kilogram is 1,000 grams. We have kilovolts. 1,000 volts is a kilovolt. And we also have kilohms, K-I-L-O-H-M. One kilohm is 1,000 ohms. Well, nobody says kilohm. Everybody just says K for short. If you look at the meter, um, down here is the ohms department, right there. For instance, when the meter is set on 200 ohms, we can read up to 200 ohms. For that setting, the meter will read up to 200 ohms, actually 199.9 ohms. If you set the meter on the K scale, you can read up to, in this case, up to 2,000 ohms. Whatever you read on the, on the meter display up here, will be in thousands of ohms. That's very important. If the meter is set on K, and the meter up here on the display says 1, it's actually 1,000. It's actually 1,000. Uh, you know, if the meter is set on 20K, you can read up to 20,000 ohms. Uh, if the meter is set on 200K, you can read up to 2,000 ohms, and so on. Now, some meters are auto-ranging. For instance, um, on this meter, uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't say K on it. You just set it to ohms, and it automatically sets itself for the proper range. Uh, some meters are like that. Some meters are not. I personally kind of prefer the actual, the meter where you actually set it to whatever range you want because it makes you more aware of what's going on. Uh, on, a, on an auto-ranging meter, you have to be careful. You'll see a little, like a little K in the upper corner usually of the meter. Maybe it's real big. It depends on the meter you get. Um, that tells you how many ohms it is. But my little K is a teeny, teeny, weeny little, tiny little letter in the corner of this meter. If you're not careful, you may be reading 10 ohms. You may, you may think you're reading 10 ohms, but it's really 10K where you won't have that problem if you have the, the other type of meter. But some people prefer auto-ranging meters. I, it really doesn't make that much difference. So we use kilo as one of the metric prefixes we use. Um, for instance, if I have a resistor that is, let's say, 2,700 ohms, 2,700 ohm resistor, this would be referred to as a 2.7K, right? 2.7K. Of course, you divide by 1,000, you, you just move the decimal place over 3, don't you? So that would be 2.7K. And if you look at the schematic diagram, the schematic symbol or on a schematic diagram, you'll see the resistor here, and it will be labeled like R123, whatever the resistor number happens to be, it might say something like 2.7K. It might have the omega after it. Okay. We also have resistors that are in, in millions. And so we have another metric prefix, mega. Mega means times one million. For instance, a, a power generating station might be referred to as, as, as uh, providing so many megawatts of power, millions of watts of power, megawatts, millions of watts of power. And we also have megohms, M-E-G-O-H-M. -E one megohm equals one million ohms, obviously. So 
uh, same thing. And if you look at the, if you look again at your meter, for those of you that have this type of meter or something similar, uh, you'll see that the the two highest scales are megohms. There's a two megohm scale, right? And uh, the next one up would be 20 megohms. You will probably find that you'll never use those ranges working on games. You'll probably never work on, use those ranges when you're working on games. As we'll see in just a little bit, when you start uh, when you start doing this resistor lab, the proper setting for your meter, if you have if you don't have an auto ranging meter, is to be as low as you possibly can without getting some kind of an overload indication. Now this particular meter says OL on it. It says OL. That's when the resistance is higher than what you have it set for down here. Other meters might just have a number one with no digits after. You'll see when we start doing the resistor lab how simple it is, and we'll do that in just a few minutes. So, uh, same thing with, uh, with large value resistors. If I have a resistor that is, let's say, 1,200,000 ohms, that would be 1.2 m omega, 1.2 mega ohms. And that's the way it'll be on the schematic diagram. It'll just say 1.2 m omega like that. Make sense? Okay, now, Sometimes we have these itty bitty resistors. We have these resistors that are in fractions of an ohm. For resistors that are 10 ohms or less, we have another way of, of denoting what the value is. Sorry, stand by. The first band of a resistor is never black. That is, it's never zero. You would think that if, if, let's say, we wanted to have a resistor that was one ohm, you would think that it would be like black, brown, black, wouldn't you? But it's not. The first, for some reason, I have no idea why. The first band is, is always brown or higher. That is, it's always one or more. But we have resistors that are fractions of an ohm, like maybe uh, 2.7 ohms or, or a fraction of an ohm, like 0.27 ohms. We have uh, another way of, of showing you this, uh, which, which value is which. Say, for instance, I have a resistor that is red, blue, which would actually be 26, wouldn't it? 26. Um, if the third band, remember the third band is the multiplier, right? If the third band is gold or silver, this is what we call a fractional multiplier. And this is how we get values that are less than 10 ohms. It's called a fractional multiplier. Now, remember I mentioned you have four bands on it, and your fourth band is gold on the resistor that I gave you. We're not talking about that band yet. I'm talking about the third band. You probably don't have one of these in front of you. But if the third band is gold or silver, here's what it means. If the third band is gold, instead of like telling you to add zeros like the third band usually does, it tells you to multiply times 0.1. If it's silver, it says multiply times 0.01. So let's say, for example, I have a resistor that's red, blue, gold. Well, red is 2, blue is 6. The gold says multiply times 0.1, which of course means just move the decimal 1 to the left. This would be a 2.6 ohm resistor. If the third band is gold, bless you, if the third band is gold, it's a fractional multiplier. It tells you to multiply times 0.1. If, on the other hand, this was red, blue, silver, silver says multiply times 0.01, which would be moving the decimal 2 to the left, it would be 0.26 ohms. The place that you commonly see these resistors is in these switching regulator power supplies, like these guys. 
Uh, there are some fractional multiplier resistors in here that you'll see when you open these things up on Wednesday. But that's how we get our values that are, that are less than 10 ohms. The third band, instead of being a color telling you to add one zero, two zero, three zeros, or whatever, instead is, uh, is gold or silver. So what the hell's that other colored band, that other metallic band? Well, the fourth band of the resistor is called the tolerance band. Remember the third band is the multiplier. The fourth band of a resistor is technically called the tolerance band of the resistor, also known as the percentage band. Here's the deal. These resistors that, we, that I've given you are called carbon film resistors. And what they are inside is a little cylinder made out of ceramic. Just like, you know, like a china plate, just ceramic. And deposited on this ceramic cylinder is a thin spiral of carbon. Now carbon, of course, is one of the elements. And pure carbon actually conducts electricity pretty damn well, almost like a wire. But by making this carbon very, very thin, it has more resistance. Obviously, the thinner it's, it is, the more resistance it will have. The way they change the value of the resistor, the way that same size resistor can be 10 ohms or 10 million ohms is they make the spiral winding thinner. This makes more resistance because naturally the thinner it is, the more resistance it has. Plus, if I were to unwind it, the longer it would be, huh? They got more spins on it. In fact, in fact, when you see a on the rare occasion that you see a burned up resistor, if you brush it aside, you can see the, the burned up part, you can see the spirals wrapped around it. Anyway, then they clamp a metal lead on each end of it like this. And then they they dip the whole thing in this epoxy, which is why it has a kind of characteristic dumbbell shape if you look at it, or a dog bone shape. Um, and the bigger ones, it's it's even more obvious than that. I'll show you one in just a little bit. So these are called carbon film resistors. Anyway, they cannot make these things exactly perfectly accurate. Every one is not exactly perfectly accurate. The fourth band tells you how accurate it is. If the fourth band is gold, as most of them are, as, as probably all, I would say almost all of them that you'll encounter will be, it's a 5% resistor meaning that it could be plus or minus 5%. If it was 100 ohms with a gold band, it would be 95 to 105 ohms, somewhere in that range. And, and virtually all the ones that you'll see in games will be, will be gold. If the fourth band is silver, it's a 10% resistor, meaning plus or minus 10%. You'll probably never see that, and you'll probably never see one of these either, although they do exist. A resistor that has no fourth band is 20% tolerance. I guess they figure if it's that bad, they're not going to bother putting a band on it at all, and they just they just don't. Yeah, so well, this one's terrible. Let's not paint it. You'll never see that in games. But if you go to a surplus electronics store, you might see uh, a resistor that has no fourth band on it. So just so you know what it is, that would be 20%. You wouldn't want to use that in games. Uh, quite frankly, silver or gold, either of these would probably be perfectly acceptable in, in a game, certainly. Okay. So, um, resistors, um, uh, resistors actually have three different specifications. When you go to an electronics store to buy a resistor, you just can't say, hey man, I need a resistor, I need an R56. He's going to go, huh? Yeah, there's three different things you have to tell them. Number one, the resistance in ohms. You know, how many ohms is that resistor? Is it is it one is it a 1k resistor? Is it a 10k? Is it a 2.7k? Is it a 500 ohm? What is it? Number two, the tolerance. Really, nobody calls it that. Everybody just calls it the percentage. And then there's finally there's one more one more specification. It's called the dissipation of the resistor, and it's measured in watts. 
The resistors that you have in front of you are one quarter watt resistors. One quarter watt. But we also use resistors that are larger than that. We use resistors that are uh, a half watt, or one watt, or two watts, or ten watts, or, or even higher. For example, um, this little resistor is the quarter watt size that I gave you. Where are we? Here's a half watt. Both of them are very common. We see both of them in game. Quarter watt, half watt, you can see the size difference between the two. They also make um, larger ones than that. They make one watts and they make uh, two watts as well. Now for larger than that, when we, when we get to larger values than that, we use these kind of resistors. This is called a, what do you call it? Surround block. It's funny, some people call it that, and I've only heard that a few times. This is technically called a ceramic wire wound resistor. You can, but some people call them sand resistors or cement resistors or power resistors. Uh, but if you look at it, first of all, you see that it has the value printed right on it, doesn't it? You can see it says 0.47 ohms. 10% 5 watts. Those are those three ratings. Number one, 0.47 ohms, resistance in ohms. The wattage, uh, I'm sorry, the, dis the tolerance, 10%, and the dissipation in watts, 5 watts. Uh, these are called ceramic wire wound resistors. That's a, that's, uh, a 5 watt. Here's a, a 10 watt, 10 ohm, 10%. You see in the upper right hand corner right up here it says 10 watts. Also a ceramic wire wound resistor. Here's a, uh, here's a 25 watt, one ohm 25 watts. Now these guys are called ceramic wire wound resistors. Ceramic wire wound. They're called ceramic resistors, obviously, because they're made out of ceramic. I mean, that's you, you can see, obviously, that they have a ceramic cover on them. And um, inside, instead of being made out of carbon, which can burn up, they're made out of wire, like in, like in your toaster or your hair dryer, the stuff that's glowing inside there. Same kind of wire, basically, resistance wire. If I'm not mistaken, it's nichrome, a nickel chromium alloy. You don't really have to know that. But they put the resistor inside here and then seal it up with this ceramic because these things get quite hot. It's not, <laughs> you've encountered that, haven't you? It's not at all unusual for these things to be like pssst, hot, like really way freaking hot, way hot. They're, they get really hot. In fact, here's a little shortcut you can use to test these things. When I see a big resistor like this, I'll just touch it. If it's hot, it's good, period. Why? Well, because when resistors fail, what do they do? They open circuit. If the resistor's open, ain't no current going to go through it. It ain't going to get hot, right? Actually, that's the way resistors work. The way resistors resist is they turn the current flowing into them, through them, into heat. Now, the teeny-weeny resistors won't get hot enough to feel, but although they do generate some heat. But I think you're all aware of there's this thing called conservation of energy that states that energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. Remember that? Star Trek 16 where Spock gets caught? Well, never mind. Anyway, so, so the current going through it gets changed into heat. So if I feel this thing and it's warm, it must be good. Now, I'm not saying that if it's cold, it's bad. Big difference between the two. I'm saying if it's warm, it, I know that it's good. If it's cold, maybe it is bad because maybe it's open, or maybe whatever the circuit is, it's supposed to be sending the juice through, it ain't working, something like that. But I know in a fraction of a second, if I can touch it and it's warm, it's good. In fact, as we go through this class, I'm going to show you dozens of common shortcuts like that, real quick things that you can do to tell if something's good or bad. Very often, you can just look at a game and infer what's wrong with it just, be, just by what it's doing. And we'll, we'll co cover that anyway. So in games, we use um, a wide variety of different dissipations, different watt, nobody calls it dissipation, everybody just calls it the wattage of the resistor. You know, how many watts is the thing? Uh, and uh, 
and most of the time they'll be quarters or halves and you'll be uh, you'll rarely be replacing these resistors because they just hardly ever fail at all. all right, so what we want to do now then is um, uh, we're going to take a break but uh, at any time during this uh, next half hour or so here's what I want you to do. If you look at page R, R3 in your book here Uh, what I have here are uh, 12 resistors. This is pretty self-explanatory. I have 12 resistors here, and underneath the 12 resistors, I've got 12 lines. I want you to put down the value of each resistor. And, uh, for instance, if we look at the first one here, let's just do the first one, red, violet, orange. Red is 2, violet is 7. Orange is three, three zeros. This would be 27,000 ohm or 27K is what I want you to put down. I want you to put it down in K. Um, now, naturally, any resistor where the, the third band is orange is K, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty easy. And what's the percentage? The tolerance? Five percent, right. Now, we can't tell anything about the dissipation because they're just printed on the page, obviously. Uh, then, so I want you to do all 12 of those. And now on the next page, R4, you have a place for five resistors here. And uh, I'm going to hand make sure that you get five. You don't, you think you only have three or four now. Whatever. Three, you only have three? Well, somebody's got four. Um, and I have five things down here, five lines. What I want you to put down is um, number one on the first line where it says band one, band two, band three, band four. I want you to look at your resistor, try to figure out what color it is. If you cannot figure out what color it is, as, as I often have trouble doing, sometimes you may have to simply measure the resistor, get an idea of what the value should be, and that will tell you what the colors are probably. If not, ask Shirley or Susan, Susan, right, yes. uh, what, what the colors are, because for sure they'll be able to tell us where, where we probably can't figure it out. 